good afternoon, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. It's my fifth AppSec and second as a speaker. Uh, last year in Amsterdam, I was talk talking about transaction authorization, about vulnerabilities and best practices in transaction authorization in internet banking. Uh, after that, I've published uh, OWASP transaction authorization cheat sheet and I, I have received quite good feedback. Uh, so this year, I, uh, uh, I decided to expand this topic also to uh, other internet banking security controls like uh, trusted recipients, functionality, uh, transaction limits, or uh, notifications. So let me introduce myself. My name is Wojtek Dworakowski. Uh, I am OWASP Poland chapter leader, and I am managing partner at uh, Securing, Polish penetration testing uh, company. My company was founded 13 years ago, and uh, for all these years, we uh, have a chance to test about 60 different internet banking applications and mobile banking applications. Uh, so I have reviewed uh, results of all those uh, security tests, and I have seen that more than often we found the vulnerabilities in uh, internet banking security features. Um, so in this presentation, I will summarize most common implementation errors, uh, and will, I will try to give advice how, how to avoid uh, typical security defects. So, in my free time, I enjoy enduro mountain biking. Uh, for me, extreme sports somehow resembles uh, uh, critical business uh, applications. So, how many of you are doing some kind of risky activities like mountain biking and others? Yeah, fine. So, I'm sure that you are using some kind of protections, yeah? So, in my case, it's a helmet, gloves, elbow pads, uh, knee pads, etc. So, but, but what if those protections will fail due to, due to bad design? So same is with internet banking and any, any, any other business critical systems. If you are using some security features, you uh, have to be sure that it will protect you uh, when they will be needed. Yeah? So for helmets, knee pads, etc., we have uh, certifications, testing procedures, uh, we, can, we could be quite sure that they will not fail in, you, in, in case that uh, you will hit the ground. Yeah? So, but what about our internet banking uh, security features? Wouldn't it be nice to have a common set of requirements or some kind of checklist to check those uh, security features? So this talk is a first step in this uh, direction. So our agenda for today. Uh, First, I will do a quick intro. I will show you some real-world real attack examples on internet banking, both on client side and on server side. And uh, just, I, I will just briefly introduce common security features. Then we will go one by one through all these security features, and, and I will try to show you uh, some common vulnerabilities in its uh, implementations, and uh, maybe uh, give you some advice how to avoid uh, those mistakes. Uh, uh, I would also like to briefly introduce upcoming changes to so-called PSD2, which is Revised Payment Services Directive by uh, European Union, uh, which brings some very important security changes. And finally, as a summary, I want to discuss the idea of uh, OWASP security guidelines for specific application domains like internet banking or e-commerce, because all of these applications, for example, internet banking, shares common security features. So it will be nice to have uh, common requirements for internet banking for other uh, application domains. So let's review common internet banking attack patterns as security features used by banks to uh, mitigate such as risk. So uh, attack scenarios could be on, on internet banking could be client side, which is generally uh, malware. Uh, and, uh, and on the server side. Uh, the malware, uh, the common attack, most common attack pattern uh, when we are discussing malware is of course web inject, when uh, malware modified the content of the web, web page. Um, uh, but we have also seen other scenarios like intercepting credentials using keylogger uh, and utilizing it via, via special remote access malware uh, module. On server side, as in other, any other application, the uh, attacker can attack infrastructure, application itself, 
or libraries or framework, the common components, yeah? Uh, so let's review some real-world examples. I will be not talking about web injects because they are quite common and probably all of you have seen some kind of web uh, inject malware. So let's uh, talk about some more interesting one. So for example, two years ago, our local, local Polish CERT team uh, have noticed a new malware tweak. This malware called uh, VBclip because it was uh, written in Visual Basic. Uh, monitored the clipboard uh, of the user, and when the user was copying account number, for example, from uh, electronic commerce uh, site or internet shop, etc., into the uh, internet banking, malware just changed its value to the account controlled by attacker. So it is very simple to implement trick, yeah, but it was and it was uh, it not quite quite easy to detect. The other more, uh, more advanced variant of this malware, called uh, Banatrix, uh, made in Poland, <laughs> uh, does exactly the same trick, changing the account number, but in browser memory, not in clipboard. So here's the demo of this, uh, of this malware. User is typing the account number, and when malware detects the account number pattern, it will magically change into the other account number trick is quite simple to implement also, but this malware was quite successful. Another real-world example from my country, from Poland, exam is an example of at attack uh, on server side. So we all know that vulnerabilities in, uh, in systems exist, yes? Uh, even in, uh, so, uh, in uh, such as applications as internet banking, but not too many exploitation examples has been documented in terms of internet banking, yeah? So one, years ago, one year ago, uh, one of Polish medium-sized banks was, uh, was uh, popped by exploiting well-known vulnerability in one of uh, Java frameworks. Uh, um, so we know about this uh, because after initial success, stealing some money, uh, attacker was detected and transfer attempts were blocked. So he tried to monetize his uh, efforts uh, by, by blackmailing the bank that he will publish the, uh, the whole, this whole story, yeah? The bank didn't pay the ransom, so he published <laughs> all the story. <laughs> uh, so that's how we know what was, what was the attack scenario. Uh, so Intruder was, uh, w w uh, after initial, uh, uh, initial attack, he was able to uh, modify the transaction because he did some kind of server-side web inject. Yeah? Uh, so here is the results. Here is the transfer. It, he transferred about, uh, as you can see, about uh, 40,000 euros. And here is uh, more transfers. The sums are not so big as for such an attack, yeah? but he was quite success successful. Uh, the bank was even nominated to Pony Awards uh, for, for most epic fail, but unfortunately, all guys from Pony Boards doesn't understand Polish. Uh, so I, for, for them, I kindly tra translated the whole story to English, so you can read it on my uh, LinkedIn, uh, on my LinkedIn uh, pulse. Uh, here's the address. Um, Unfortunately, the uh, competition in, the, in this category was quite, quite strong last year, so probably the U.S. Office of Personal Management won in this uh, category, but Polish bank were nominated. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, the, the story is quite, uh, quite, quite useful if you, if you uh, want to have some good attack examples for your CEO, so please read it. So how bank mitigate this risk? Uh, they are using different safeguards and layered approach. So uh, just like in sports, uh, you are wearing all those security gear just in case of trouble, yeah? So in case of banks, we have a multi-factor authentication, transaction authorization with trusted recipients feature. We have authorization schemes, uh, transaction limits, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and in case of sports, we are wearing all, all those protections just in case but you want to be sure that it will work when it will be needed, yeah? But what if some of these safeguards will fail under attack, 
Yeah? What if you will hit the ground? Uh, so let's review some examples of vulnerabilities in internet banking uh, security features. Uh, first is transaction authorization. I was talking about this uh, last year. Uh, who was on my talk last year at uh, Amsterdam? Not so many, so uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> uh, presentation is available online, so I will just do a quick uh, recap. So um, here's a transaction authorization example. You are filling the long form uh, with uh, transaction details. You are clicking uh, confir confirm the transfer. Uh, and after that, you have uh, another form when, when there is a place for, for example, in this case, for SMS code. So you are receiving the SMS transaction authorization SMS code from your bank. You can manually verify uh, recipient account number and, uh, and, uh, and amount of money. And you should uh, manually rewrite this uh, authorization code into this uh, place and click sign. Yeah? That's the basically typical authentication, uh, transaction authorization process. But of course, you can use the SMSs, the other stuff, the other gear provided to you by bank. The, uh, yeah, this is just an example. So I would divide the vulnerabilities in transaction authorization to two groups. First, uh, there are functional uh, vulnerabilities uh, or just bad design deci decisions by bank. Uh, here are some real-world examples. First is uh, SMS code, like this. Uh, so this is, uh, as you can see, we, we don't have a beneficiary account number, so we cannot verify the beneficiary account number in this e SMS. We have also, uh, we have only, um, uh, we have only uh, source account number, so we can just verify that the attacker is stealing money from us. Yeah? Uh, so that's uh, a first functional vulnerability. The other uh, bad decision is to use uh, wrong devices, wrong means of transaction authorization. For example, more than often, especially in business banking, we, can see, we have seen that uh, bank is using the uh, secure ID tokens for both uh, user authentication and transaction authorization. And uh, those tokens are great, one-time passwords generated by time. Uh, in, in terms of second factor uh, user uh, authentication, but not so great in terms of transaction authorization. Because using these devices, you can, a user cannot validate the transaction data. They, can o they are only providing the one-time code so malware, when you have a malware on your, uh, in your browser, can easily change the transaction data and it will be still authorized using those uh, tokens. But more interesting are non-functional vulnerabilities. So let me uh, show you just one uh, example. Uh, when you are filling all, all those uh, transaction details on the first step of transaction uh, process, uh, we are clicking OK and uh, here is uh, HTTP POST request. So we have an uh, account number, we have an uh, amount, and we have some kind of uh, uh, title yeah, for, uh, uh, for, for this uh, transaction. Then browsers receives web page with transaction authorization, and user has to enter this auto authorization code, uh, for example, from SMS code. So uh, user is entering this code, and here's the POST request. As you can see, uh, the URL is exactly the same in the first step and in the second, in this special implementation. And the state is only controlled by, by this task parameter. Yeah? So what, what we tried to do, uh, we just oops, we just added some parameters, and we were able to uh, efficiently uh, overwrite the transaction data, which is the account number and the amount. And the transfer was executed in this case. So this is just uh, another example of, uh, of potential vulnerability. So you can find more vulnerability examples uh, in my last year uh, AppSec presentation. And also, uh, I have uh, written transaction authorization cheat sheet with best, best practices how to avoid uh, such as mistakes. Um, by the way, I, I'd like to uh, thank for feedback for everyone who reviewed this paper and helped me to publish the final version. It was really a pleasure to work with these uh, guys. So thank you. Uh, 
transaction authorization is good from security point of view, but it's, it is not very convenient because you have to authorize uh, all your transactions, yes? So um, it's super annoying when you have to enter all those one-time codes each time, yep? So we have so-called so trusted recipients or uh, trusted transaction templates. We can authorize given recipient only once uh, and then we can make transfer to this recipient without any additional authorization. So here's the example. We have defined, uh, uh, defined uh, account numbers, which is, uh, is non-trusted uh, non and trusted. So there is no additional uh, authorization for any transfer to this account because it was uh, authorized only once and system is cons uh, considering this account number as a trusted uh, recipient. Fine, but what if this functionality will not work ac as expected? So uh, I have to say that this functionality, this very functionality in, in internet banking is very error prone. We found about, uh, in, in, our, uh, in our cases, we found about, in, uh, about 30 percent of penetration tests, we found uh, vulnerabilities in this uh, trusted recipient uh, functionality. Why? I don't know. My bet is that developers are first writing the code for normal transfer and then during next uh, sprint they are just adding this uh, trusted recipient functionality. So it's not easy to control business logic in such as uh, approach when you are just adding some kind of uh, logical decisions, etc. So let me show some examples from my practice of potential vulnerabilities. Uh, so, first attack example is quite uh, simple. Uh, we are sending unauthorized, untrusted, uh, normal transfer to untrusted recipient, and application should ask us for authorization code. Yes? But we can add uh, some magic like this, and in this case, it works. So, we all know that uh, important security decisions should not be driven by client side, but in this case, we just added the parameter that the transfer should be trusted, and voila, transfer was executed. Uh, the other, another example is to override data. So we, we were creating the transfer using trusted recipient template. Yeah? So we have, have all recipient data, uh, beneficiary account, etc., filled in by from, from the trusted template. But maybe uh, we would be able to override this, and in this case it, wo it works. So we have used the trusted recipient template with account number, and we, we were able to override this uh, data at the uh, later uh, stage of processing. So this is the, another example. Probably you are asking yourself how it's possible, uh, me, me too, but it worked. In this case, the problem was that all processing was uh, in a single object and server side was not properly controlling the state of the, of the, of the processing. Uh, but when we are talking about really unbelievable uh, examples, let's go back to our own bank. So in this case, as you can remember, the attacker gained the full control at application server. So what he did, uh, he did some code review for a bank, and uh, he found really, really nice bug in, uh, in this trusted recipient functionality. So when one user uh, created trusted recipient, it happened that when any account will, would send a, a transfer, to this recipient from any other account, the, the, uh, the transfer still be, will be considered by banking system as trusted. So it is just a horrible logical bug. So in case of attacker, attacker could just uh, do any uh, transfer to his money mule and then can, he can uh, pump out the money from any account to this money mule without any additional trans uh, transaction authorization. So I know it's uh, totally twisted, but this is the real example from the real attack. In this case, uh, this uh, attacker was trying to pump out about uh, half million euros using this method, but he was, uh, he was detected by some kind of internal uh, transaction monitoring system, uh, and all transactions were uh, blocked. Uh, unfortunately for him, but fortunately for bank. 
So he then decided to blackmail uh, the bank and uh, he was not successful. So he published, uh, the, he sends whole the story to local IT security uh, blogs. And here is my translation into English. Yeah. So what are the recommendations for uh, trusted recipient functionality? Uh, first, we, uh, uh, first, all security deci decisions should be taken entirely server side. They cannot be influenced by some parameter either by the, by the client. Next, you should uh, very carefully control uh, whole, whole process and you should do not allow additional parameters. But more th most important is that control gate, the decision if the uh, transfer should, be, uh, should go or, or not go, should be taken at the end of the process, after final, final processing, just before sending the uh, money. So that's my recommendation. Next on security feature is transaction uh, limits. So user or a bank can define limits and system will not allow transfer when those limits are uh, reached. So here we have uh, limits for a, for a uh, transaction yeah? above a given, a given uh, sum. Uh, uh, usually we can have many kinds of limits in transaction in uh, internet banking system like uh, limits for transfer, for card operations, uh, for cash operations or online. We have uh, limits for one-time operations or weekly or daily or monthly, etc. If the limits is, uh, uh, limit is exceeded, then our internet banking application can forbid uh, operation can ask us for additional authorization, uh, additional credentials, or for example, a uh, consultant from bank can call us uh, to verify uh, the transaction. But uh, what if transaction limit implementation has some kind of bugs? So first example is uh, quite easy, uh, it's super simple. Sometimes we can just change limits without any additional action, without any additional trans uh, uh, transaction or operation authorization. So malware on our station can just change our limits and that's all, yeah? So that's very first uh, example. Uh, another example is case of uh, bad business logic. Uh, so let's imagine that we are doing the transaction below, below limits, yeah? Uh, on the server side, limits are uh, validated, and then we have uh, some kind of confirmation uh, form. Can you tell me what is wrong with this process? Yeah. So the problem is that the limits are validated here between tho those steps and not at the very end. So if we, if we will find some bug, uh, that we can add some parameters at this stage, like this, then can we, we, we can increase the uh, transaction amount and completely bypass the safeguards. And this is also the real world uh, example. So what are requirements for transaction limits? Actually, they are very simple. First, we should remember that all uh, transaction limit change should require uh, additional authorization, yeah, because without that it's useless. Uh, so we should also have uh, these control gates, uh, this final decision at the end of the process, not in the, in the middle. So th that's our uh, requirements. Uh, the next security feature is uh, notifications. Uh, so user is just notified by external means like SMS or email or push message to his mobile app uh, if the condition, given condition is met. For example, the transfer is above defined uh, amount. So uh, what, i what if uh, this functionality will be implemented with some errors? Uh, unfortunately, I don't have sexy vulnerability examples for notifications uh, because they are happening server side. Yeah? So the only thing I, uh, I want uh, to talk about is uh, that, of course, when you are changing something in a notification, it, will, it should require additional auto authorization, same as with transaction limits. Yeah? Uh, so that's the first requirement for, uh, for notifications. But also, I would uh, like to say that we can do uh, 
notifications more creatively. For example, uh, usually banking system are notified us that, uh, that there was a wrong authentication attempt. From my point of view, uh, I would rather prefer to be notified when, when, I am, when there is a positive authentication attempt. So if I am working and we, when I am sitting at my office and I will, would receive the SMS that somebody, somebody has just logged in into my bank account, it's a just clear uh, compromise indicator. Yeah? So we can use those uh, features like notifications a little bit uh, better. Uh, the last one is uh, user authentication. So, uh, of course, in case of uh, internet banking, it should be secure and very convenient for user, which sometimes is difficult to achieve. Yeah? Uh, user authentication is a broad topic, but uh, I just have, uh, and it is not very specific only to the uh, internet banking system. So I just have one thing to, to say about this in case uh, of internet banking. We, as uh, security professionals, we all uh, we, we are advising, uh, we are teaching normal users uh, to have uh, strong passwords. Yeah, we all know this uh, XKCD comic: how to create strong passwords. So in this case, this password has 28 characters. So, but would it be possible to use such a password in internet banking? Please check with uh, your bank. Uh, this year, for a leading Polish business newspaper, uh, leading Polish news business newspaper asked us uh, to do some research on security feature used by uh, online banking in Poland. So we have uh, checked the 17 different implementation of internet banking, uh, just for simple security features. Uh, among others, we uh, checked if it is possible to use strong passwords or passphrases, long passphrases. Uh, or use passwords generated by password managers, uh, etc. And here are the results. Uh, as you can see, most of banks limit password length. We, fi we found few banks that, are, that were limited password length to 10 characters, some to 20, and only one third, uh, actually one third of banks would allow such as strong passwords. So. Uh, for me, it's something, something really strange that banks are limited the uh, length of passwords, but also we found other obstacles, like limited cars, limited characters. In extreme case, one of banks uh, uh, require only eight digits as a password. The, so it's uh, super simple to crack. Yeah? Uh, the other functionality, which is a real obstacle in terms of password managers, is so-called mas masked passwords that you should, you should provide only given letters from your password. So you cannot use the key pass or, or other, other password uh, measures or, or, or it will be not so simple. So that's uh, just a one point in terms of uh, user authentication. Don't block passphrases and don't block uh, password managers. Don't put the obstacles. Okay, uh, enough of this uh, vulnerability shooting and vulnerability uh, examples. Let's look at the future. What kind of security features and problems should we expect in nearby uh, future? Uh, how many of you are familiar, somehow familiar with PSD2, uh, revised uh, payment services directive of European Union? Not so many, but, but uh, uh, good that someone is familiar with it because it's very important topic. Uh, so let me just very quickly, briefly introduce key changes for online banking uh, security. So we have uh, three major topics in Payment Services Directive, uh, PSD2. We have a uh, strong customer authentication, payment initiation services, account and account information services. And all those major changes will be mandatory for all payment service providers, including banks. So let's review them. First, strong customer authentication. It's a very good change because basically it's just a two-factor uh, authentication. Uh, so uh, the requirement is that uh, payment service provider should use two or more elements, something, only, uh, something that user knows, something the user uh, possess, or something the user is. So it's a way for biometric authentication or two-factor authorization. 
uh, and sh it should be used both for user authentication and for transaction authorization. So generally, it's a very good idea and very good regulation in terms of security. But the other changes are a little, a little bit uh, controversial. So first is payment initiation service. Nowadays, when we are doing internet shopping, probably all of you are paying by card or PayPal or something like that. But and when, when you would want to uh, pay use, using transfer, you should just go to your bank, make a manual transfer. The bank will transfer the money to the merchant bank, and the merchant will receive the money. The problem is that this process is not instant. Uh, the transfer took, uh, usually, usually took, uh, take, takes some time. And the merchant will be notified after one day or two days about the transfer. So the idea to make the, this uh, transfer instant uh, is to have a special payment initiation service provider between uh, user and merchant. So uh, merchant redirects user to uh, payment initiation service provider. Uh, payment initiation service provider uh, take your uh, transaction data and uh, it passes it, it pass you to, to your bank. You're, you should be logged in into your uh, bank account manually and uh, just make, a, make this uh, transfer. Yeah? Uh, the key is that this bank can notify back payment initiation service provider, usually going through your browser, and payment initiation service provider will notify the merchant that uh, you ordered the transfer. Yeah? So the process could be, uh, could be instant. Uh, mostly, this process could be implemented by a special API provided by banks, yeah? uh, so-called pay-by-links. But the problem with pay-by-links, the business problem is that banking, uh, banks are charging payment service providers and merchants for transactions for, uh, for with pay-by-links. So, uh, unfortunately, a new kind of services emerged which we are trying to bypass those charges, and they're just using scraping. So there are something, some providers like Sofort or Trustly that are just taking your credentials to your bank and they are, they are mimicking your behavior. So here is the example. This is the top-up process in nowadays uh, common in European countries, top-up process of uh, PayPal account. So first on the PayPal site, you are choosing your bank, then you are redirected to a uh, Trustly service, and in this Trustly web page, you are providing your user credentials. It's not so good from security point of view, yeah? But it's broadly used here in Europe. In Poland, we are quite lucky but because we as uh, users and, and as a security community, we were uh, pushing uh, some changes and uh, some provide some pressure on uh, PayPal to uh, change this process to more secure, and now this process is not possible here in Poland. Uh, we are just we just having just normal pay by links instead of this uh, scraping thing with uh, Trustly. Uh, the other change uh, is account information service. Uh, according to this regulation, each payment service provider should have special service, special API which will provide consolidated information about user accounts. Uh, so consider such as examples as uh, a personal finance manager uh, application or automated credit worthiness uh, or financial situation analysis. Nowadays, you should probably have some kind of software on your, uh, on your computer that will go to each of your banks, will log you in uh, using your credentials and then uh, will uh, just pull uh, the transaction history, etc., to analyze your finances, uh, etc. Uh, after account information service implementation, uh, there will be possible to implement it uh, using uh, account information service providers. So, so you will be, uh, you will have some kind of uh, online application in the cloud. Uh, and uh, this online application can go to each of your banks uh, and pull the information. Nowadays, it's done by scraping because there are some su such a kind of services that you are providing, again, your uh, user credentials and they are mimicking you 
uh, and trying to uh, push, pull the information from banks, but also uh, it could be done by banks API, but nowadays uh, not so many banks provide, this, uh, provide uh, such as API. So what are, what are the possible uh, uh, problems? The problem is that this is the new functionality. We will have the new APIs, we will have these uh, providers, and of course, all, this, all those new, new software can, can have uh, vulnerabilities. What are the consequ consequences? Payment data change, unauthorized access to users' data, maybe on mass scale, if somebody will hack this account information service provider, uh, authentication by bypass, etc. So we should have some kind of strong uh, requirements for those uh, services. Uh, so uh, maybe we as OWASP should take some action, yeah? So now it's uh, like that, uh, that of course the directive for Euro of European Union is high level, but uh, European Banking uh, Authority uh, will issue so-called regulatory technical standard in January next year, uh, but until then, st current status quo, quo should be maintained. So uh, they released so-called discussion paper, but call, call for comments was closed uh, on February. You can read my uh, uh, application security-related comments uh, on my LinkedIn uh, Pulse because I published it uh, openly. But maybe we as OWASP should take some action, so let me know if you are also somehow involved uh, in this uh, process of making this, uh, this regulatory technical standard. Maybe we should do something together. So as a, uh, as a summary, uh, what, she, what, she, what can we do with this, all those uh, problems? We know that implementation errors uh, and vulnerabilities in security controls uh, are, uh, makes, makes all those controls, all, all those safeguards uh, useless, so uh, and they, uh, they they make false sense of security for users and for banks. So wh what can we do? Of course, we ca we should have uh, precise requirements before implementation. But precise requirements, especially non-functional non one, is like Yeti. Everybody say that uh, it should exist, but nobody have seen them. Of course, I am exaggerating a little bit. Uh, we should have. Uh, strong requirements, uh, very precise, but not so many people are implementing this because it take, takes time, especially when you are implementing complicated systems and you should write uh, precise, requir requ uh, pre precise implementation requirements for non-functional things. Uh, so, of course, uh, we have best practices, checklists, cheat sheets, etc., as OWASP, uh, for uh, for common problems like SQL injection, cross-site scripting, CSRF, etc., or for common security, uh, or for common features like authentication, two-factor th authentication, uh, etc. But we will not find requirements specific to our business domain, like internet banking. So maybe uh, if we have some application that shares common risk profile and common security features, like online banking or mobile banking, maybe those payment initiation services or accounting information services, e-commerce, SCADA, social networking, or simple company web page. They are sharing common security, uh, common risk profile and common security features. So maybe we as OWASP should work and we should produce some, ki some kind of common requirements for common application. So, there is a proposal from me. For internet banking, we should write maybe some kind of online banking cheat sheet, maybe some kind of module, some kind of checklist in form of, of uh, ASBS module, maybe development guide chapter. So if you are interested with helping with this project, so please contact me after the uh, presentation. This is just an idea to discuss. Uh, so, Take care about your safeguards and stay, stay safe. Uh, maybe you have some kind of questions. Thank you.
No. Uh -huh. the, question is, uh, the question is if uh, there are some technical requirements in PSD2. Uh, there will be. The uh, European Banking Authority is working on those regulatory technical standards. So now they have published discussion paper with some ideas and discussion is opened. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it's common for all bank and for users, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it is in, s in which country? Sweden. So, uh huh? Okay. But the third party. And you just receive it from your mobile, you receive your certificate, and from there you can get any kind of signing, uh, messages, what you are about to do, exactly what you're going to transfer. Even there is one more app that is, is extending this one, where I can use it, I can send I can send you I can send you money to your mobile. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the question? <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. So uh, I, I will just repeat for a recording. So in Sweden, uh, there is a common third party that are used by all banks and uh, all users that have a um, ability to authorize the transaction, etc., to log to help you with second factor, I think. So the very similar idea is in this uh, PSD2 recommendation because they are thinking if, they will, uh, if, if there should be such a service as a third party or for whole European Union or for just uh, uh, countries. And this idea is called IDES, AIDAS, uh, and this is ju just the other project of European Union. So probably this implementation in Sweden is somehow related to this. But not in every country you have a, such a service because it's, uh, it requires to have a um, common service for all banks. Yeah? So it's not so easy to achieve in terms of business, <laughs> probably. Yes, of course. The question was about mobile, uh, mobile application because in, uh, as you have noticed that uh, in mobile application often the REST interfaces, REST API is uh, used and REST is even more error prone than the normal request we all know about this and if I have uh, any recommendation. Of course there are plenty of them but this is just a separate work probably uh, for a specific of mobile banking because the uh, threat, threat model uh, for mobile banking is slightly different. So if you want to help with uh, those recommendations for mobile banking, probably it's good. Mm -hmm. PSD2. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, the question is if in 
PSD, if, in, if, if in PSD2 there is a requirement to open the interfaces, yes, to other, to mobile banking, etc. Uh, there is and there is no, because uh, there are only two services in PSD2 which will be required, payment initiation service and account information service. But they both together works like that, that probably in a few years, maybe bank will be just the storage and processor and interfaces can be built by third party, by fintech companies, etc. because you have ability to initiate the transfer and you have the access to account information. So there are only uh, requirements for, all for those two. But the problem is that uh, PSD2 is high level. There is no technical requirements. And from PSD2 point of view, also scraping, using or, uh, scraping is a form of API. Ah, actually, Sofort, for example, is a very strong player, so uh, now he's pushing European Union to accept this way of doing things. Yeah. Yep, so, so 